Writing the introduction of a manuscript is the easiest part of the writing process. There are basically two things that you need to do. First, you introduce what is unknown in the field, and then you say what you did to fill that gap. So start writing the introduction only after finishing writing the result. Here is why. When you start your research project, you have many different aims and hypotheses that you want to test. However, there is no research plan that resist contact with the bench. You could write hypothetical introduction for all these questions, but this is not how most people approach their writing process. While writing the result sections, you answer specific questions doing specific experiments. These and only these questions are those that you can write about in the introduction. If you want a more in-depth explanation of how to write the result section of a manuscript, check the video on the link. Okay, let's talk about the structure of the introduction. The most common way to structure your intro is to start by broadly defining what you are studying and then you explain where the knowledge gap is. The big picture and the big question should come as early as possible just to frame the whole manuscript. Then you can write a few paragraphs for one or more smaller questions together with their relevant background. And in the final paragraph, you explain the main experiments you did to answer these questions. You give a brief synopsis of the results and you can end with one sentence explaining the implications of this mind. Although not everyone agrees that these last paragraphs belong to the introduction, it has become a very common practice with good reason. The reader wants to ensure that the authors address the questions with a reasonable approach before they commit to reading the whole thing. Let's see how this works in the practice. We are going to look at a recent paper by a colleague published in PLOS Genetics. Do not worry about the details of the paper. I'm just trying to give you a real example of how writing an intro works. I will interpret the specific knowledge so for you so that you can focus on the writing side. We start with the first part of the intro. The authors first introduce these peewee proteins and their importance in spermatogenesis, the right Piwi proteins are germline specific argonal proteins that play pivotal roles in genome defense and spermatogenesis. Then they say that these proteins have different domains. All three Piwi uh, proteins share conserved protein domains, meat, pass, and miwi. And then they explain what is known about a particular domain. A variable and terminal domain common to all Piwi proteins is dysfunctional characterized and contains multiple. RG motifs that are subject to RGN methylation and so on. Then they talk about the gap that they will cover regarding the function of the RG uh, rich domain in spermatogen. And they write, however, how these RG motifs direct PW proteins to engage in pyRNA pathway to regulate spermatogenesis remains elusive. So that is the first section introducing the first background and asking the first implicit question. Now let's move to the second part. The author explained that MIWI can do two things in spermatogenesis. MIWI play critical roles in transposon silencing and joint cell differentiation, as MIWI knockout mice show drastically upregulated line one transposon in spermatocytes and round spermatids and display germ cell arrest at the round spermatid step of sperm. Then the authors present the gap that they are going to address. Despite MIWI's important roles, it remains unclear whether transposal dysregulation causes, causes germ cell arrest due to MIWI deficiency. Very good, so far so good. We have the first part of the intro with the two sections. We have first the first background followed by the first question and then the second background that is followed by the second. Okay, now let's move to the final paragraph of the introduction. First, the authors introduce what they did, they write. Here we use a conserved RG motif of MIWI as a prototype to study the in vivo function of RG motif in mammalian PIWI protein. And then the authors describe the first find. They write, we discovered that the MIWI and terminal RG motif is crucial for MIWI function and spermatogenesis. And then they describe their second finding. Importantly, the RG motif mutation separates the two effects of MIWI ablation, spermiogenesis arrest, and line 1 transposon activation. In this way, the last paragraph briefly explains what the authors did 
follow by the first finding that uh, answers the first question that they post, and then the second finding that answers the second. So the readers, including the manuscript reviewers, expect every issue brought up in the production to be directly addressed in the results section. If any question is not addressed directly, the readers might become disappointed because you created false expectations regarding the scope of your manuscript. I think it's important to be completely clear on what questions are considered as directly addressed. An issue is addressed directly if and only if a relevant experiment has been performed to address it. Coming up with theories does not count. As for the reviewer, two things can happen when open questions are left in the introduction. In the first case, you might be asked to moderate your introduction and eventually remove some passages, but this rarely happens. In a second case, however, the reviewer may request you perform experiments to address the issues. In the second case, you can end up having to address issues that are most likely out of scope, and as a result, you will spend time and resources during the revision of your manuscript that you could have avoided. Okay, what happens with the new questions your research created that you still need to address? Well, you should cover them in the discussion of the manuscript. Check the following video in the series for a more in-depth explanation of how to write the discussion section of your manuscript.